Hi. So building on what um, Chris presented on um, the, the nature of the RPS, I'll talk about um, the legal aspects of it, right? I'm a law professor. That's why um, I don't have a PowerPoint or don't know how to make um, PowerPoints. Um, and I'll assess the legality of the, the, the rehabilitation projects for us. As you can imagine, it's not legal um, in a developed country such as the United States to have um, what is essentially a private prison. So we'll talk about why that is, right? Why certain things um, can be done by religion that are otherwise illegal um, and why that specific example is not one. Um, we'll also talk about how that makes Scientology different from other religions, which often don't have these kinds of penal facilities or have or had, right, um, these kinds of penal facilities. And finally, we'll talk briefly about how it is that you can have these things, even if they are um, otherwise legal. Um, and, and it's something having to do with both the interaction of right internal rules or legal systems of, of, of religious organizations, how that interacts with what I call the mainstream legal system, the regular secular legal system. It also has something to do about how the regular legal system, right, and other institutions such as the police rely on people to voluntarily complain about stuff um, when a crime is committed. So. Um, in developed countries such as the United States, there are significant protections of religion. That's because we recognize um, as societies that religion is a really important part of who we are, right? It's important in um, us finding happiness, finding satisfaction in life, bonding with other people, um, and having a sense of self that we think is extremely important um, to our conception of what it is to live in a developed society. For that reason, the law protects a great deal of things having to do with religion. It does that in a number of ways. The first one is by constitutional protection. So the constitution um, in most developed countries will specifically protect the right to practice one's religion. It has a number of consequences. First, there's a, an individual aspect to it, right? So for example, the government can't tell you what to believe or what not to believe. The government can't prevent you from praying in a park in most circumstances, even though a park is not right, a private location. It can't prevent you from trying to assemble to practice your religion with other people who share your religion. That's the individual component to it. There's also a group component to it. Even though the group, right, a religious organization itself, which is just a bunch of people together, right, even though that's not specifically protected under constitutions, it's indirectly protected, as we'll see, because people have an ability to essentially not obey the law, right? To um, bind themselves and obey rules within their religious organizations that are different from and often inconsistent with the rules of the mainstream regular legal system. And the government, right, has that bubble around the religious organization and decides not to intervene. And because of that, right, um, you have these religious organizations able to exist somewhat independently from the regular legal system um, and with rules, as I said, that are different from and inconsistent with those of the mainstream legal system. Then you have another set of consequences under other laws um, where we also protect religion as an important aspect of what it means to live in a devout country. Usually it has to do with um, certain labor laws, right? So we don't force religious organizations to pay people overtime, for example, um, or to pay them at all. Um, we, we allow for religious volunteers, for example. And there are certain consequences under taxation statutes. So religions can get um, the, the privilege of not paying taxes, various forms of taxes, right, municipal taxes, income taxes, all of that, right, essentially means that the organization, if it's granted tax exemption, won't pay taxes, and the individual member will be able to write off whatever they give um, from their own taxes. These are two different sets of consequences. The latter, as I just suggested, are a privilege. So you don't have a right not to pay taxes. You don't have a right um, not to pay your religious volunteers. For that, you have to meet certain criteria, which will be in the statute, right? So there'll be a law that will say what the criteria are, and then the organization has to meet these criteria. 
In contrast, constitutional protections are what we call inherent. They just apply, right? In actuality, someone at some point has to go to court and say someone did something illegal, and then the court has to say, no, it's protected under freedom of religion. But conceptually, it's inherent, right? Whatever practice you claim under freedom of religion was always protected before you even showed up to court because it attaches inherently. As soon as you have a religious belief, and often that also covers right, spiritual, non-strictly religious beliefs, also covers the absence of beliefs um, in, in most countries. Right? But as soon as you have a religious belief, it is protected. And so it doesn't matter that it's a destructive belief, that your religion is really bad. It doesn't matter that it abuses people. It doesn't matter that it's subject to gross financial mismanagement. These things are inherent, right? There's no assessment of whether the religion is good or not, and therefore no ability of the court to deny protection on that basis. So that protection, as you can imagine, attaches to Scientology, whatever you say about it, right? You can say that Scientology should lose its tax exemption, which is a legitimate legal argument that you can make, um, but you can't say that it should lose its constitutional protection as a religion because there's no such thing, right? Because it attaches inherently even to a religion that's just bad, if that's your opinion. So because of that, Scientology has constitutional protections. This has a consequence that I mentioned. So individually, people can practice their religion in private, in public, together or alone. And you have certain protections that attach to the group. So Scientology is able to, as a group, exist somewhat independently from the mainstream legal system and from mainstream society generally, because there are rules as to right, how much you can intervene. So the courts or the police or whatever governmental public institutions we have will decide not to intervene because of constitutional protections. They'll say we just can't get involved in that um, because of the Constitution. And that creates, as I said earlier, a bubble of independence around a religious group. It allows a religious group to exist independently from the regular legal system, it allows it to have rules that are different from those of the mainstream legal system and to enforce them. However, these rules are usually very different from those of the usual legal system in, in that the punishment is very different and specific and namely, it is excommunication. So if you don't respect the rules, right, which again can be very different, but if you don't respect the rules, you get kicked out of the religion. That's the punishment. Um, different from the court system, usually the court system takes away your freedom or your money. It's two things it usually does. A religion can do neither. It can just kick you out. That's the, the consequence. And as you can imagine, right, that can have a very serious impact. Usually getting kicked out can mean um, that you lose your eternal salvation, which you might care about a lot more than your um, than your freedom or your money. And similarly, right, um, especially with um, certain religious groups such as Scientology, there are certain policies that also make it such that you're very likely to lose your friends or family members or people who are dear to you if you are excommunicated. So that's the limit. And that limit exists, right, among other things, because you cannot derogate from the criminal law. So you can have, as I said, different rules, right? You can derogate from regular laws with your internal religious legal system, but you can't derogate from the criminal laws. And that's why you can't physically punish people, because that would be a crime, right? If you hit someone, it's what we call assault. If you imprison someone, right? It's a combination of assault and something else, both of which are um, criminalized behavior. Um, and under the criminal law, consent is not really a defense. So you can't hit someone even with their consent, unless it's a weird specific situation, like say a box match. So it doesn't matter that you have their consent. So you can't derogate from the criminal laws. That's why you can't have private physical punishment, either as right an individual, you can't have a prison in your basement, or as a religious group, you can't have a punishment facility. And Scientology is unique in that, right? It does, or it did um, for a very long time have that kind of a facility. That separated it very significantly from other religious groups, which almost universally adhere to the traditional principle that I've just mentioned, right? Where you have a, a system which can be very broad and all encompassing like Scientology's, but ultimately, Right, that system 
is applied with the regular consequence of excommunication, not something else, and certainly not physical punishment. And that's because, right, um, you cannot have that kind of punishment under these constitutional protections, even if the person consent. So the question comes, why is it that Scientology is able to do this? Um, and it's important to stress in the first place, everything I've shed so far, namely that it is illegal. And there's been some confusion with um, a case called Healthy Researches Church of Scientology International, where essentially they, they were uh, members of Scientology's full-time clergy, the Sea Org. They were claiming something having to do with a crime. And it seems that some people got the message from that case that you could consent to criminal behavior or could consent to assault. And it even seems, and though that's somewhat speculative, that certain government agencies got that message and chose not to prosecute for that reason. And that in law is absolutely wrong for the reasons I mentioned. You cannot ever consent to anything having to do with a private punishment or detention facility, even if, right, hard labor, if it's imposed on you in the context of a specific corporal um, punishment. So why is it you have that? Well, I think two main things, right? First, what I said about independence, because you have that bubble, and that bubble says the government won't intervene, right? So it won't look at how you apply your religious doctrine, your rules, which are different from those of the regular legal system. It won't look at whether you apply them properly, right? There's a case called Garcia v. Scientology, where essentially it seems that the, the church was applying a policy in a way that didn't make sense based on the words, but the court right, doesn't get to say that. It just doesn't even get involved because of that bubble around it, um, which prevents the court and other agencies or government entities from intervening. So as you can imagine, well, if the government doesn't look, it doesn't know. So it might very well be that within that bubble of legitimacy, of independence, within that right base where all sorts of things happen pursuant to that religious legal system. The government doesn't know that a crime is essentially being committed because the government doesn't look. And that's an indirect consequence and certainly an unintended one of right, the independence that we do provide, which does cover certain things by virtue of the constitutional protections that I mentioned earlier. The other thing is we rely on people to complain. That's how it works, right? Courts don't make decisions on their own, right? You can have a very smart lawyer uh, go to court and say this law is unconstitutional. It doesn't work that way. The court doesn't get to rule on that, even if it knows very well that that's the case. You need to have a plaintiff. You need to have someone complain and that someone has to be personally affected. And then the court can rule and often in a more general way, right? If say something's unconstitutional can cancel the law, but you have to have someone complain in the first place. And as you can imagine, it's very hard to have that in the context of religious organizations generally, because complaining has certain very serious consequences, similar to the ones we mentioned, right? Excommunication, um, not being able to, um, to stay in contact with your friends or family, um, and for that reason, of course, people don't complain. And so you're allowed to have in actuality lots of things that are otherwise legally prohibited simply because, right, the system doesn't apply itself. And certainly people of faith would probably be surprised that we have all these rules because they, it's not their lived reality. Because in reality, no one complains about these things. And oftentimes we see that with sexual assault, certain other um, criminal behavior, oftentimes there's very Placid and strong pressure on the part of religious organizations for people not to complain. And that's prohibited under the rules, even though, right, it's not something that you can have under the law. So it's another crime, right, which we won't get into to prevent someone from filing a police complaint. But in actuality, as I said, right, you have these serious consequences. You rely on people to complain on their own. And oftentimes, for obvious reasons, they won't. And so in actuality, it might be that the protection that's afforded to religious organizations and the things that they do do, right, is far broader than what's usually provided for under the law. 
And as I said earlier, that's somewhat a consequence of that independence we have under the Constitution, even though it doesn't cover that. And all that in the end is really about right fundamental things, about the human experience. We protect that because it's important, because we want people to be happy, to have meaningful lives. And people right, don't just obey the law. They don't read the criminal code before they go to sleep. They subject themselves to rules, including rules that are not within the mainstream legal system. And that's how you explain human behavior. And that's how people try to live together as a group. It's how they make rules on how they'll live together. And ultimately, it's how they try to find happiness, right, jointly um, and individually. And inevitably, you have that clash at some point. You have these conflicting rules, and you have to have mechanisms for how you reconcile them. And oftentimes, as we saw, mechanisms that have unintended consequences that we have to ask ourselves if we're still willing to live with because of their benefit.